taken from the second chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus in those days that all the world should be counted. Now, this was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own hometown to be counted. And so Joseph went up from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea to the city of David because he was of the house and lineage of David. And there he was counted with Mary, to whom he was engaged and was expecting a child. And it's while they were there that the time came for her to give birth. And she delivered her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place in the inn. Now, in that region, there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid, because I bring you good news of a great joy, which is for all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was with the angel a whole multitude of the heavenly host, angels upon angels upon angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to all. Well, after the angels had gone back up into heaven, The shepherds said to each other, come on, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this great thing which the Lord has revealed to us. And so they ran to Bethlehem. And sure enough, they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the babe lying in a manger. And they told everyone they met what the angels had told them about this child. And everyone who heard it was simply amazed. But Mary... Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for everything they had seen and heard, just as it had been told to them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. God chose Mary and Joseph. God handpicked Mary and Joseph to be the earthly parents of Jesus. And as Jesus' parents, their most important job was not to feed him and clothe him and shelter him, although they certainly did that. And it was not to teach him a trade, although Joseph taught him to be a carpenter. And it wasn't even to take him to the synagogue and teach him how to pray and worship God. Their most important job as Jesus' parents was to love him. Their job was to love him as best they could, as a baby, as a boy, and as a young man. Because if he were to be a loving Messiah, he needed to be as fully loved as possible as a child. Now, to be sure, the love of his heavenly Father was always there. But Jesus needed to know what it was like to love and be loved as a human, as you and I are loved. He didn't know what that was like until he began to grow up. 
And so to be able to identify with us fully, he needed to be loved as a child so that he could be a loving Messiah when he became a man. And so Mary and Joseph did. They loved Jesus as best they could. And in loving him, they also were loving God. That when they loved their son, they were also loving their Lord. When they loved the child in the manger, they were also loving the one who had sent him from the glories of eternity. In loving Jesus, they were keeping the two great commandments, to love God and to love others. The same is true for us, that when we love a child, we are also loving the Christ child. Let me tell you a famous story you may know that I think illustrates what I'm getting at. Victor Hugo was a famous French novelist back in the 1800s. His most famous novels are The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables. And as you probably know, Les Mis was first a smash Broadway musical and then it was adapted to the screen as well. And so it's a story that's been told in multiple ways. And the central character in the story is Jean Valjean. And as the story begins, he is just getting freed from 19 years in a brutal French prison. He was sentenced to 19 years because as a boy, he stole a loaf of bread from a bakery in order to keep his family from starving. And the punishment far outweighed the seriousness of the crime. And so those years in prison did not make him a better man. They made him worse. And he left prison an angry, bitter, hateful man. Well, he went from village to village trying to find work, trying to find a room, but he had to carry a yellow card and show it whenever he appeared in a village. And that yellow card identified him as a former prisoner, as an ex-convict. And whenever anyone saw that, they rejected him, didn't want him to stay in their village, and told him to move on. Well, finally, in desperation, he came upon the home of a bishop. And this kindly bishop took him in, fed him, gave him a warm bed for the night. But that night, Valjean went downstairs, stole the expensive candlesticks that belonged to the bishop, and slipped out of the house. But he was quickly caught by the local police, and they brought him back to the bishop and fully expected the bishop to tell them that this prisoner had stolen these and that he should go back to that prison. But the bishop said, no, they were not stolen, they were a gift, that he had given them to Valjean as a way to help him start a new life. And so they released him. And Valjean didn't have to go to prison again. And the bishop said that he had redeemed his soul for God and that he wanted him to make good with his life. Well, that gift from the bishop began to soften Valjean's heart and he decided to become a different man and a better man. And he settled in a little village in northern France, began to work, changed his name, and over time saved his money and started his own small business, a small manufacturing business. Well, one of the women that he hired for his business was a young woman named Fantine. And Fantine had been seduced by a young French nobleman, and when he found out she was pregnant, he abandoned her. And so as a single mom in France in those times, she struggled to keep body and soul together for herself and for her little girl, Cosette. And she couldn't do it because there was no way she could work and watch Cosette and there was no such thing as daycare centers in France in that time period. And so she decided to turn over Cosette to a husband and wife. They were innkeepers who had a small inn on the outskirts of town. They said that they would take good care of Cosette. They would do everything they could for her, treat her as their own daughter. 
but they didn't. They were just in it for the money. And so little Cosette was overworked, worked tirelessly from dawn to dusk. She was neglected and unloved. But the Thanadiers, the couple, kept telling Fantine that they needed more and more money for her care. And so Fantine first sold her hair, and then her teeth, and then her body to try and support herself and Cosette. But eventually it was too much, and her body began to break down, and she knew she was dying. But before she died, she asked Jean Valjean, who had hired her and had been so kind to her, if he would make Cosette his own. And he was reluctant to do it because he had never had a child. He didn't know the first thing about being a father. But finally, he agreed. And so he went to the inn, and he paid the couple an exorbitant amount of money to get Cosette. And he rescued her from that terrible situation. And he took her and adopted her as his own, and he raised her. He gave her the best that he had and the best that he was, was and he lavished his love on her. And Cosette became a young, strong, beautiful, loving young woman. And eventually she was engaged to a young man named Marius. And Valjean was thrilled by the engagement because he knew he didn't have long to live. And he knew that she would be in a good marriage with Marius. Well, Valjean's body began to break down as well because the years in prison had been so hard on him. He had to do cruel back-breaking work. And it finally caught up to him, and he knew that he was dying. And so he called Cosette and Marius to himself to come to him, and they did. And he told Cosette that she had been the greatest blessing in his life, the greatest gift he had ever received. And Cosette told him the same, that to have him as her father was the greatest blessing she could have imagined. And then Valjean gave to Cosette his dying blessing. And of course, in the musical, this was sung, and this is what he said. He said, on this page, I write my last confession. Read it well, when I at last am sleeping. It's the story of one who turned from hating the man who only learned to love when you were in his keeping. Take my love, for love is everlasting, and remember the truth that once was spoken. To love another person is to see the face of God. That's what Valjean learned in raising Cosette, that to love another person is to see the face of God because in the Bible, the phrase to see the face of God is a metaphor for being ushered into the personal presence of our loving God. And that's what Valjean experienced, that as he loved Cosette and grew in love for her, he began to experience for himself the love of God, that in her face, he saw the face of God. He loved the Christ in her. To love his child was also to love the Christ child. That love transformed Cosette, but it also transformed Valjean. It was that love that made him a different man, that enabled him not to be a bitter, angry, hateful man, but to be a kind, loving, caring father. And the more he loved Cosette, the more he loved others. And the circle of love, family and friends and neighbors, grew larger and larger through the years. To love another person is to love, is to see the face of God. And that's true no matter who it is. To love father or mother, to love brother or sister, to love son or daughter, to love friend or neighbor, even to love 
a stranger or an enemy is to see the face of God in their faces. And I believe that's especially true when we love a child. When we love a child, we also love the Christ child. That kind of love, the love that allows us to see the face of God in the faces of others, is most likely to happen when love is at its best, when it's at its highest and holiest. Years ago, I ran across something that Catherine Hepburn had written in her memoir called Me, Stories of My Life. It's as good a definition of biblical love, of agape, as I have run across outside the Bible. And this is what she said. She said, it seems to me that I've discovered what I love you really means. It means I put you and your interests and your comfort ahead of my own interests and my own comfort because I love you. Love has nothing to do with what you are expecting to get, only with what you are expecting to give, which is everything. What you receive in return varies. If you are very lucky, you may be loved back. That is delicious, but it doesn't necessarily happen. This kind of love is transformative love because it's the love that most closely mirrors God's love for us. That Christmas is about the fact that God chose to come into our world to be born for us, to live for us, to suffer and die for us, to be raised from the dead for us, to give his spirit to us, to promise to come back and take us into his wonderful eternal kingdom. And he did all that not for his benefit, but for ours. Not out of his best interest, but ours. His love is a self-giving and a self-sacrificing love. And when we love like that, then we begin to see the face of God in the faces of others. Because he loves us like that, even when we don't love him in return. Even when I reject the love he is so freely given. Even when I choose to do my own thing rather than to do his thing. Even when I choose to go my way rather than his way. Even when I keep on doing the things that break his heart. He still keeps on loving me. No matter what. Love. Love is the reason he came at Christmas. He came in love, and he came as love, and he still does today. He does because I believe there are far too many children who are having to grow up like Cosette did in that inn before Valjean made her his own. And there are far too many adults in America today who are acting out, acting like Valjean when he was still a prisoner and not when he was a caring, loving father. People who are doing mean, ugly, hateful things. And I wonder, is it because of a lack of love? Is it because they believe that they are unloved, and maybe even may be unlovable. And if that's true, what they need is love. So this Christmas, love one another. Love one another as Mary and Joseph loved Jesus. Love one another as Valjean loved Cosette. Love one another in the way that Catherine Hepburn described. Love all the people the Lord brings into your life. Love them deeply and dearly as best you can. Because to love another person, and especially to love a child, is to love the Christ child. And to see in that child the face of God. Amen.